Hello, I'm Nick Herriman and welcome to 25 Concepts in Anthropology where I try to give you what I think are the top 25 concepts in anthropology in 10 minutes or less. Today I want to do the biggest concept of all in anthropology and that's anthropology itself. What is anthropology? Basically anthropology is the study of human society and culture. The question we ask is what is it to be human? What does it mean to be a human? And anthropology has several different ways of answering this very important question. The first one is biological anthropology. Um, now, biological anthropologists might compare, for example, a human jaw with the jaw or mandible of an orangutan, an orangutan, an orangutan, and see what it is that makes us, us unique, let's say, from them. Linguistic anthropology is different. Linguistic anthropology looks at the connection between language and social and cultural life. Uh, so a, a linguistic anthropologist might record a conversation between people and try to see, for example, how they are understanding something like uh, the weather, weather change or climate change or something like that. Archaeology, you're all probably familiar with from Indiana Jones. That's the, uh, the kind of study of like very old bones and stones and other things. Um, and what I am doing in this series is called cultural anthropology or social anthropology or socio-cultural anthropology and that's basically a study of different societies. We look at very different societies and try and find out what it is that all humans have in common. In other words there are four different approaches within anthropology to the question of what it is to be a human. First is the biological, second is linguistic, third is the archaeological and fourth is the socio-cultural anthropology. From now on, I'm just going to call socio-cultural anthropology, anthropology. Now, every discipline has a unique, a unique way of looking at the world. The way, for example, somebody in English looks at a 1500s love poem is different to the way an anthropologist is going to look at that poem. We, we look at it for different things and, and with different ways. So, uh, as it happens, the way somebody in English, when they look at a poem, they're going to see a lot more than an anthropologist is going to see, or at least they'll see it very differently. So you can think of each uh, discipline as having its own lens or its own toolkit, if you like. Um, now, if I am a plumber and I bring my toolkit along, I might be able to do some electrics, but not much. My toolkit isn't good for doing that. In the same way, if I'm an anthropologist, I bring my intellectual toolkit along and try and study uh, a 1500s love poem, I might, be, I might be able to do some things, but not as much as somebody who uh, is in the English department. On the other hand, if I'm looking at an initiation, uh, my toolkit is perfectly suited for this. Whereas somebody from English can bring their toolkit along and they won't see as much. They won't be able to do as much with an initiation. So, the other important point about the way uh, the lens or the toolkit of each discipline is that uh, it obscures some things and illuminates others. You can only understand one thing by blocking out other things. You, you, you can't get the complete view, if you like. We, each discipline looks at different things from different angles. So what is the anthropological toolkit? Typically we say there are three elements to it. First is relativism. Uh, we, we, we suspend moral judgment while we're analysing for the purpose of understanding. For the purpose of understanding we don't judge things at first sight. If we see, for example, in the Ngatajara, the Western Desert Peoples in Australia, uh, sub incision where a knife cuts the penis in half from the bottom and circumcision where a knife cuts off the foreskin of a penis we don't look and go oh how brutal how disgusting we rather try and seek to understand it in relation to the uh, whole society and that brings us to the next point in anthropology which is holism we try and understand each thing we look at each practice each belief each phenomenon, if you like, each socio-cultural phenomenon in terms of a larger, broader context of, and framework of the whole society and even uh, larger historical forces and international forces. And finally, our approach, the third element, we've looked at relativism, holism, the last one we're going to look at is comparison. We use similar concepts to analyse different societies, concepts that include things like kinship, uh, 
magic, ritual, rites of passage. That is the kinds of concepts I'm trying to give you in this series. Now one thing that distinguishes sociocultural anthropology from the other three branches is, well, particularly from archaeological and biological anthropology, what anthropologists, what sociocultural anthropologists pride themselves on is being the fieldwork discipline. We prioritise knowledge that is obtained from somebody being there. Being there is the big thing in our discipline. Um, what is there? It used to be thought of as another society, typically a village or a jungle or a desert society. And you would live there for at least a year, so you get all the seasons, summer, uh, autumn, winter and spring. And you'd get all the, at least you get all the rituals in, in an annual cycle, at least. Um, now, what we, what we really emphasize is not so much what people tell us. We like to listen to what people have to tell us about their lives and so on. But we actually like to observe what they're doing, what they actually do, and get past that. And we also want to analyze their behaviors and actions and not just what they tell us. So for example, an Indonesian anthropologist comes to Australia and studies me and says, Nick, uh, what about TV? Do you watch that? Do you watch soap opera? I say, oh, no, I never watch that rubbish. Now, if he went away with just that, he would say, well, Australian men don't like watching soap operas. But if he came to my house and lived with me over a year, he might sometimes notice me flicking through the channels and I might stay on a soap opera for a bit longer than I might have admitted to. So that's why we emphasize being there. And we like to contrast it. So when that Indonesian anthropologist goes back to Indonesia and say, well, this Australian man denied watching soap operas, but actually did watch them a little bit. What does this say about the society? That's where anthropology starts. And anthropology comes from an encounter. So this uh, Indonesian anthropologist comes to Australia and studies me and he asks me, what about your family, Nick? And I say, well, I've got uh, my cousins and they include, for example, my mother's uh, brothers and sisters, children, and my father's brothers and sisters, children. Um, and I call them cousin. Now he might say, well, this is very interesting because the Australians uh, refer to these people as cousins. In Indonesia, for example, uh, cousins include what Australians would call second cousins. We don't have, but Indonesia doesn't have a special term to distinguish them, indicating that what's important for us, a distinction between a first and a second cousin, isn't so important there. And that Indonesian uh, anthropologist might find it interesting that I don't use a different term when I'm talking to a cousin who's older than me and a cousin who's younger than me. He might say they use the same term. They, they refer to them by their first names. Whereas in our society, in Indonesia, this anthropologist would say, in fact, we uh, have a different term. We'll say kaka for older brother, older sister, older cousin, older second cousin, older, uh, and we use adit, younger brother or sister, younger cousin, younger second cousin. So the important thing in, he, he could then deduce in Australian society is more these vertical connections between brother, sister, cousin, and second cousin, whereas in, at, whereas in Indonesia the, the important thing is younger or older. And this will tell us something about society. The importance, for example, in Indonesian society of age um, and order and hierarchy. So really anthropology comes out of an, in, an encounter. The anthropo Indonesian anthropologist comes to Australia and studies me and learns something. I go to his society and study his society and learn something too and we develop these concepts, the kind of concepts I'm going to be teaching you in this series in order to understand, in order to understand what it is to be human. What is the similar things between being uh, Indonesian and being Australian? And terms like kinship and some of the terms I'll also describe to you will be helpful in this regard. Finally, I want to talk about social construction. Anthropology uses the idea of the social construction of reality. It's an important concept, the social construction of reality. We assume that our vision of the world, our understanding of the world and the way we act is socially constructed. We have made sense and we, we want to look at how it's constructed, why it's constructed and to what effect. It's very hard for me to give you a quick example of this, but maybe this will suffice. Consider the difference between, for example, the 1950s housewife 
the 1980s super mum, the 1990s soccer mum, or even now in America, the NASCAR dad. Now for the 1950s woman, this image of the housewife would have uh, structured the way she understood herself. It would be a model of, of how she should behave and if she didn't live up to it she might not feel uh, sufficient. And the way a children might view his, his or a child might view his or her mother in the 1950s might also be uh, shaped in this regard. They might say, oh, my mum is like this or uh, fits this model or doesn't fit this model and feel shame or pride, for example. As a result, our most intimate experiences, the experience of our mother in the 1950s is experience, different to an experience of one's mother in the 1980s, 90s or in the 2000s and, and so on. Our most intimate experiences, anthropology argues, are socially constructed. And this is what the Indonesian anthropologist would find if he came and studied my life. The way I interact with my mother and other Australians interact with their mothers is different to the way that Indonesian people do. And it's by comparing these different societies in a holistic way, taking regard the whole society in a relativistic way, not judging this or right or wrong, on the basis of fieldwork, spending a long time learning the language, that we get at the kind of knowledge that socio-cultural anthropology produces. And through this series, I'm going to be expanding on that kind of knowledge by focusing on the concepts through which we compare these different societies. Thank you very much.